So in part one, we talked about how the maesters, the high towers, and the strongs influenced Targaryen succession and marriages. This led to Viserys the pushover becoming king, Alicent Hightower becoming queen, and a whole lot of alienated people in House Targaryen and House Valarian. Meanwhile, Archmaester Gildane is whitewashing history to make the maesters look innocent and the Targaryens look like a bunch of crazy sex fiends. Now before we get back to history, I'd like to go over a few more accusations made by Lady Dustin and Maester Marwyn. The gray rats read and write our letters, even for such lords as cannot read themselves. And who can say for certainty that they are not twisting the words for their own ends? Lady Dustin has a point. The maester's control over communication gives them incredible power. They tend to us when we are sick and injured. Out of gratitude, we give them a place beneath our roof and make them privy to all our shames and secrets. A part of every council. And before too long, the ruler has become the ruled. Again, it's hard to argue with Lady Dustin. The maesters are well placed to be spies, counselors, and even manipulators. Say nothing of prophecies or dragons unless you fancy poison in your porridge. Whoa there, the maesters are murderers? Assassins? Well, the maesters are armed with all sorts of undetectable poisons, and Maester Crescent did try to kill Melisandre, and Pycelle did let John Aaron die. In a world where women die in childbirth all of the time, and babies are stillborn all of the time, and people die of infection and disease all of the time, it would be impossible to determine if a maester let someone die or murdered them. And as Crescent's mind tells us, an education in healing at the Citadel includes an education on killing. The simple fact that the maesters are equipped with poisons that make murders look like accidents is pretty damning by itself. The maester's complete control over medical care makes one wonder about certain events in history. For example, Viserys' first wife, Emma Arryn, repeatedly suffered from miscarriages. She had two sons die in the cradle, and she herself died in childbirth. Without those sons dying, or Emma dying, or Alicent Hightower being the right age, the Dance of the Dragons may not have happened at all. Maybe those deaths were the maester's fault and maybe they weren't. We'll simply never know. But maester treatment can be awfully fishy sometimes. For example, in the year 126, Viserys cuts himself on the Iron Throne, gets an infection, and loses a couple fingers. He never again sits the Iron Throne, and Otto Hightower effectively runs the country. Viserys is sick and bedridden for three years after this cut, and Gildane's writings about the period are incredibly odd. You see, the rogue prince ends with Viserys' death, and the princess and the queen begins with it. However, the rogue prince ends with Grand Maester Gerardis taking care of Viserys, but the princess and the queen begins with Grand Maester Orwile taking care of Viserys. So there was a switch in maesters that Gildane decided to not tell us about. This is a little odd as Gildane tells us that Gerardis was very effective. Though I wonder how effective, considering Viserys was practically bedridden for three years. So what happened to Grand Maester Gerardis? Well, Varys reveals his fate in A Storm of Swords. Aegon, the son of Viserys and Alicent Hightower, fed him to a dragon. How on earth did Gildane fail to mention this in his histories? Perhaps Aegon was suspicious of his father's medical treatment as well. Whatever the case, Viserys dies in the year 129, and the Hightowers begin their coup. Otto Hightower and the small council convene, and Grandmaster Orwile says some strange things. A raven must needs be sent to Dragonstone at once to inform Princess Rhaenyra of her father's passing. Mayhaps her grace the queen would care to write the message, so as to soften these sad tidings with some words of condolence. Yeah, or while, that's never gonna happen. Alicent and Rhaenyra hate each other. Also, why should the widow be sending out condolences? Shouldn't she be receiving them? And of course, we must begin our preparations for Queen Rhaenyra's coronation. All right, or while, it seems at this point it's pretty obvious that some people don't think that Rhaenyra is gonna be queen. Are you trying to piss the Greens off so they won't compromise? Or is Gildane just trying to make Orwile look neutral? After Otto Hightower and the small council announce their plan to crown Aegon over Rhaenyra, Orwile says that the issue will certainly lead to war. Why must it lead to war? Why can't there be power sharing or co-rule or a few marriages to sort things out? There are probably hundreds of different compromises that could have been made between the Blacks and the Greens, with all of them being better than going to war with dragons. Let's keep in mind that after Viserys' death, Aegon didn't even think he was king. And Rhaenyra had no ill will towards Aegon. She believed he was manipulated by the small council. Whatever the case, Orwile is sent to Dragonstone to treat with Rhaenyra. Gildane writes that the terms offered by the king were generous, 
If the princess would acknowledge him as king, Aegon would confirm her in possession of Dragonstone. Her boys by Prince Daemon would be given places of honor at court. Of course, these terms aren't generous at all. Rhaenyra already has Dragonstone, and Aegon is asking for two hostages. But just as Tyrion says in A Clash of Kings, unacceptable terms are a beginning. Bargaining and negotiation involves a back and forth, and yet Orwell never returns to Dragonstone again. He screws up his trip so much that negotiations completely break down. That makes Cleos Frey an infinitely better diplomat than Maester Orwell. But of course, a breakdown in negotiation may be exactly what Orwell intended. Another breakdown in diplomacy happened at Storm's End. Rhaenyra's son Luke arrives at the castle to win over the Baratheons. Unfortunately, he's been beaten there by Aegon's brother Aemond. Now these two have a history, and Aemond lost his eye in a fight with Luke. Now Luke is a little out of luck, as Aemond has agreed to marry a Baratheon daughter, while Luke is already betrothed. Nonetheless, Luke delivers Rhaenyra's request for Baratheon's support. Now Lord Boros Baratheon is illiterate, so the maester has to communicate the contents of the letter to him. We're not sure what the maester said, but it causes Baratheon to frown and call Rhaenyra a bitch. He then gives Aemond leave to go attack Luke outside, despite the fact that Luke is an envoy. What probably happened is that the maester twisted the words to make them sound harsh to anger Baratheon. But let's assume that the message was actually a really rude commanding. Isn't it still the maester's job to soften the blow? At best, the maester mismanaged an explosive situation. At worst, he did it intentionally. Luke and his dragon were killed outside of Storm's End, and the Dance of the Dragons began. Now, despite only having a few houses support her and being stuck on Dragonstone, Rhaenyra actually has the advantage in the war. She simply has many more dragons. In fact, the Greens basically only have four that they can ride. So as we mentioned, Vagar first kills Arax, and in a three-way battle, Sunfire and Vagar kill Melis. A fleet from the Free Cities kill Veramax and Stormcloud, but it's not good enough. The Blacks conquer King's Landing and take the dragons there. Sunfire is injured, and so the Greens are down to two dragons. The Blacks have essentially won. But then two letters, one at Tumbleton and one at Maidenpool, change everything. Two of the Black's dragon riders, named Hugh the Hammer and Ulf the White, defect for some reason. Gildane oddly claims that we'll never know the truth about the incident because Hugh and Ulf were illiterate. But what does literacy have to do with the issue? Gildane also weirdly claims that Hightower men had infiltrated Hugh and Ulf's men, but that it wasn't important. It seems much more likely that Gildane has it backwards, that Hugh and Ulf were literate, and that the Hightower men were important. Could those Hightower men have passed a letter to Hugh and Ulf? Gildane then claims that Hugh and Ulf demanded the Iron Throne and Highgarden. But why Highgarden? Why demand the possession of your ally when you can demand the possession of your enemy? Why not Winterfell? The reason for choosing Highgarden was supposedly because Ulf saw the Tyrells as traitors because they didn't participate in the war. But of course, this makes no sense at all, considering that Hugh and Ulf were traitors themselves. It seems much more likely that a Hightower letter offered Highgarden and the Iron Throne to Hugh and Ulf. Whatever the case, these defections led to the Second Battle of Tumbleton, where four more dragons were killed. Hugh and Ulf were also betrayed by the Hightowers there. Now Daemon and the dragon rider Nettles are hanging out at Maidenpool. The Maester of Maidenpool shows them a letter, supposedly from Rhaenyra, ordering the death of Nettles because she heard a rumor that Nettles was banging Daemon. It seems remarkably odd to suddenly worry about infidelity in the middle of war and angering Daemon and killing a dragon rider would be incredibly stupid strategically. It seems quite likely that this letter was a forgery of some sort, perhaps by the Maidenpool Maester. This all results in Nettles flying off to Essos to be never seen again, and Daemon to go off and have a suicidal fight with Aemond. And so we can see a few well-placed letters really even the score between the Blacks and the Greens. And then there's a riot in King's Landing that kills off all but a few of the dragons. Although Gildane reports that the rioters were overcome by some sort of madness, it's rather clear that whoever stormed the dragon pits were well-organized, well-armed, and well-motivated. But who could be the culprit? The maesters certainly don't have control over the small folk of King's Landing, and neither does House Hightower. Who could possibly motivate hundreds of people to run into a burning dragon pit? And what could possibly make these people think that they could become dragon slayers? As it turns out, there's one more group from Old Town that knows a lot about dragons. And that group is the Faith of the Seven. And we'll talk about their role in the Dance of the Dragons in Part 3.